Tony On is taking off, showing off the best New York has to offer. So whether you're looking for family fun, you have a need for speed, or you just want one wild ride, Tony On New York, the hip list of what's happening in and around the tri-state area. Sponsored by ChevyOffers.com. This week, Tony On is taking on Central Park. We're going way beyond the greenery. Foodies, forage for your lunch with a wild man, or go old school with soul food. We're face to face with leopards, monkeys, and bears. Oh my. So come on, people, let's do it. Yeah. And this week, we are going totally green. We are checking out New York State's oldest continuously operating farm. Dating back to 1697, it sits on 47 acres. But who knew there was a farm in Queens? Plus, we have found the perfect post-farm old school treat right here in Queens, where the Sundays are so decadent, not even the Tony on team could tackle them. You ready, buddy? Mommy on New York. We have headed to Central Park, 843 acres of gorgeous greenery, accounting for 6% of the island of Manhattan. Now what appears to be a natural park for city dwellers to enjoy could not be further from the truth. In fact, Central Park still harbors its fair share of secrets. We're going to spend the day exploring Central Park, Manhattan's urban oasis. And we're starting here in the prehistory. We're on the cusp of Seneca Village, the Irish and African American community, about 250 people that lived right behind us on the west side, turned out 83rd and 86th Street, lived here and displaced to build this park. They had a church, they had a school, they had bought their lands, they planted orchards. People lived here and the city came in and gave them a small amount of money to get out so that we could have this incredible space. One of the saddest parts about the park. There are more property-owning, voting African-Americans living right here than anywhere else in Manhattan. They lost everything. We've come a couple hundred yards south of Seneca Village. We've left the forgotten history of Central Park to the highest point in the park to one of the most visible, Belvedere Castle. 1867, Calvert Vox designed. For Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox to win the award, to build this park, they had to fulfill four obligations. The first was a watchtower that they creatively and artistically did right here. To look out for fires. Yes, and for ice skaters. There's a pole that they'd raise and lower a red ball to say whether or not it was safe to ice skate. But this brings us to our second requirement. So Seth, the second thing they had to build was a lake? Not exactly. They had to build a skating area. But Olmsted and Vox took that very narrow interpretation mm -hmm. and gave us the lake, which would freeze every winter. Very nice. We're here on Bow Bridge, which is the beautiful cast iron bridge connecting the two pieces of land over the lake. And it's just absolutely spectacular. Now, I wouldn't want to drink this water. <laughs> Neither would I. No, but for requirement number three, they had water on the mind. This is one of my favorite parts of the park. And it should be, because this is Frederick Law Olmsted's favorite part of the park. We're right here at Bethesda Fountain, 1873, the only permanent sculpture in the park done by a woman, Emma Stebbins. A little controversy, she was paid $60,000 to build this, an unheard of amount of money, and her brother was the president of the park's commission at the time. <laughs> Doesn't hurt. No, but Bethesda Fountain, biblical word to celebrate the fresh drinking water brought to New York brought to the world, we drink, it's celebrated here. Seth, I've never been here before. <laughs> this is one of those secret, kind of scary parts of the park. <laughs> 
This leads to the fourth major requirement that Olmsted and Vox had to fulfill, and that was build east-west transverses for the flow of traffic. Now, they preserved the quiet oasis of above by burying the transverses, and they come down below. Now it's buses and trucks and cars, and it's horrible. But they had to cut this tunnel through the solid stone, the Manhattan schist, in order to make this possible. Seth, this feels more like the Adirondacks in Central Park. And well, it should. This is the Ramble. This is actually my favorite part of the park. 37 acres of just nature. And the whole idea was meandering paths through the bedrock and through the trees. And you're supposed to forget New York City. You follow the gill, the Scottish name for the stream that ripples through here. It's meant to remind the people of New York that this was once a natural environment. And where did all the rocks come from? Most of these were here, but these smaller ones, everything was put in its place. Olmsted and Vox were absolutely adamant about designing every aspect. The stream, not natural. Each of these rocks placed here so it would flow a particular way. Every tree planted. Everything from top to bottom planned. So New Yorkers owe a lot to these guys. They do, and in fact, I call this the largest work of art in the city. It is a carefully composed painting, and the frame are the buildings that now surround the park. Now after a full day of walking around and learning about Central Park, a girl's gonna get hungry. So guess what, people? It's time to eat. Now if you're looking for food and you're on the north side of the park because you happen to be checking out the Harlem Mirror or Fort Clinton, have we got the spot for you that won't go to war with your wallet. Right at the corner of 110th and Columbus is Miss Mamie's Spoonbread 2, a true neighborhood fave up here in Harlem. Last week someone came in, they said, is my mother back there cooking? Because <laughs> this food tastes just like my mother's homemade cooking. Meet Norma Jean Darden, a former Wilhelmina model, who at the prompting of a food editor at Vogue wrote this cookbook. That led to a catering business and eventually to this restaurant. She named the place after her mother, who used to cook all of this incredible soul food for Norma and her sister. What's it like working with this lady? It's wonderful. These days, her fantastic staff is hard at work keeping the magic alive for all of her dedicated followers. This is our fried chicken, the best fried chicken in town. If you come to Harlem, this is it. <laughs> fried chicken, barbecue ribs, short ribs, string beans, collard greens, candy yams, mac and cheese, fried shrimp or barbecue shrimp, and the fried catfish. What's your secret to your fried chicken? Well, actually, the secret is just a little touch of cayenne pepper mm -hmm. and nutmeg, but not so much that you can taste it, just that just hint. Just a hint. It makes a delicious gravy. Mmm, it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> That's ridiculous. Oh, thank you. <laughs> And of course, we can wrap it all up, put it in a box, and you can take it to the park and eat it on the grass. What's the deal with your mac and cheese here? Because I hear it can't be beat. Well, that has um, condensed milk rather than regular milk. It makes it creamier and sticks together. Sick. <laughs> I could like smear it all over my body. <laughs> now, we're certainly not the first to spotlight spoon bread, too. Oprah's bragged about it, Bill Clinton is a customer, and she even catered Obama's book party, which was particularly poignant, being that Norma's own grandfather was nine when slavery was abolished. And here at Miss Mamie's, if you think you can leave before you try her sister's baking, think again. And Lois, what kind of cake is this? Coconut cake. Coconut cake. Let yes. me just show the audience, it's missing a piece because my photographer already <laughs> tried it. Thank you very much. Now when you head to the east side of the park to 5th Avenue and 64th, that is where you will see the Arsenal, a building that is older than Central Park itself. The Arsenal was built 1848, finished 1851, predates Central Park, and is a beautiful building, but what's really interesting is it was used to store munitions and arms to defend New York. From this site, it was very strategically located to get troops and arms river to river or down to the city if they were ever needed. But these days, it is strategically located for families looking for a wild adventure. 
the fact that it's in the middle of New York City. I mean, there's two polar bears right here, smack dab in the middle of Manhattan. It's just pretty amazing. Tell me about the history of the Central Park Zoo. This zoo is pretty amazing. Uh, there have been animals in this location since the late 1850s. The zoo itself has been a zoo since the turn of the last century. Been here for well over 100 years, so just an amazing place. Uh, the WCS, the Wildlife Conservation Society, took over management in 1984, rebuilt the zoo, and uh, has been running it for the public since 1988. The best part, you can't stump New York City kids once they've been to this zoo. Trust me, I tried. All right, so what's the difference between seals and sea lions, Donovan? Sea lions have ears. Good job! Good job! It's way to go! It's great for people to be able to have this connection with wildlife, otherwise, why would they care? And that's what we're really all about, is making that connection, helping people care about wildlife, want to save it, want to have their representatives save it. And so it's a great thing to have these animals here in the city where children will get to see them that may never get to see them. Man, I love this place. Sea lions, snow leopards, yet not a camel in sight. But if you were in Sheep Meadow about 100 years ago, you would have seen them right here. We call this the Sheep Meadow. Originally, it was a crucial component of the park the military parade ground. But by the time they got around to building it, military parades were outlawed. So in 1864, Olmsted and Box introduced sheep. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's very funny, very economical, but very funny that in the park they had full-size camels pulling large manual lawn mowers to trim the lawns in Central Park about 100 years ago. But years later, Sheep Meadow saw much more than just livestock. History was made in this part of the park. Forget about a couple of sheep. You had 100,000 people here in April of 1967 as Martin Luther King Jr. and Dr. Benjamin Spock led an anti-war protest here that marched to the United Nations. Now these days, people bike and blade their way through the park, but if you happen to walk through on a random day, you just might catch the New York Philharmonic rehearsing at the Nuremberg Bandshell. The Philharmonic is part of just the culture and musical heritage of New York. They were founded in 1842 and in the oldest symphony orchestra in America. And what's incredible, they're usually across the park at Avery Fisher Hall in Lincoln Center, but now they're here in the band shell. We've had music played here for decades, out in the open and all weather for people to enjoy, and they're carrying on two traditions, their Philharmonic tradition and a Central Park tradition. Well, we savor the sounds of the Philharmonic. Word in the park is that our man on the street, Mr. Mark Droyella, is about to savor something else. We're in Central Park, not for a very unusual music festival, but we're foraging for food. If, of course, you consider this food. He says eat it. That's purslane. It's a wild plant, quite delicious good source of omega-3 fatty acids and iron, and it's fun to cook with. There are people who won't even lie down on the grass in Central Park without a towel because they're afraid of touching the grass. And yet you forage and actually eat what you find without washing it or checking it out. I check it out. If you eat the wrong thing, This has a triangular leaf, okay. it has serrations, and if you crush it, it smells like garlic. This is a very easy one to recognize. Wait, you went to the garlic uh, card already. <laughs> okay, that tastes terrible. Yeah, I like, don't know what the opposite of what Tony does is. When she goes, mmm, I don't know if it'd be like, Aah! What I tell the kid. Here's a delicious vegetable called Asiatic day flower. It tastes like string beans. And it gives you a blue nose. Very sweet. Get a blue nose from it, too. <laughs> I've been doing this for 27 years, except for the winter, every year. No one ever gets sick. People get healthy from this. These foods are loaded with vitamins. They're way more tasty. If you're a foodie, you like to cook, you like to experiment with unusual foods, uh, which includes a lot of New Yorkers. 
this is the place to come. So Tony, as you saw, I have tried just about every wild food there is in the park. No, and I have no, there's, there's so. way more. There's more? Oh yeah, there's June berries, there are mulberries, there's hen of the woods mushrooms, there's giant puffballs, there's uh -huh. cattails, there's pokeweed, uh -huh, yeah. there's milkweed, there are elderberries. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see what's Kentucky over here by the uh, sixth tree. train. Uh, there is sheep sorrel, there are mint species that are delicious, there are autumn olive berries. Where did he go? This week we are going totally green, so we have taken off to check out New York State's oldest and continuously operating farm. Dating back to 1697, it sits on 47 acres. The Queens County Farm is the perfect trip for the whole family where kids can learn the importance of being green hands off. And today we have our green team on the scene. First up, my mini me, Jericho Jack is back, along with his totally cute cousin Sophia, one of her BFFs, adorable Eureko, and their other buddy, Miss Emma. Tagging along was big man on campus Max, his big sister Lucy, and their mom, city kid author Allison Lonestein, who's been a fan of the farm ever since she was a kid. It's right in the middle of the city, right off the parkway, and you feel like you're in the country when right. you're here. Yeah, now you're, you're a Brooklyn girl. You got city kids. What are kids like when you bring them here? When I first took them here, um, they were just so excited that they could feed the animals. I wanted to bring them here to educate them on farm life and to realize that you don't have to compromise having, um, you know, in, in a rural adventure, even though you're an urban kid. And it's open 365 days a week, and it's also free. Now at the farm, they make and sell their own honey, they make their own wine with grapes grown right here, and they even sell fresh eggs. And while your kids might think that's cool, they will definitely dig the hayride. All right, load them in, load them up. One at a time, slowly. All right, supervising adults must also be on board. I'm not responsible for all of your children. Is everybody ready for a bumpy hayride? I can't hear you! Yay! Welcome to the Queens County Farm Museum. This is the working farm that goes back to 1772. Built by Catherine and Jacob Adrian from Holland. I'm on my way, I'm on my way. This farm was the second most popular Long Island potato farm up until the late 1800s. Because in the latter part of 1898, Queens and Brooklyn became part of New York City. We've got our two cows over here. We've got Fran, a year and a half old, and we got Bella, a year and a half. They're both milk cows. In order for a cow to give milk, she must become pregnant. We get uh, from milk, we can uh, cool it down, because it comes out warm, we can cool it down. Overnight, the natural fat called heavy cream flows to the top. We can put it into a butter churn, we can make butter. If the butter was yellow, the cow has been eating grass. Grass is being because of chlorophyll. If the milk, if the butter is white, the cow has been eating hay straw. Now after the hay ride, it was time to check out the animals up close. The kids even got a chance to feed their new farm friends. These are all goats, and they're all girl goats. And because of us, they look different like we look different. We look like our parents, they look like their parents. So you got some goats with big ears, some with little ears, some with horns, some without horns. They give birth uh, at the end of March, early April, normally to twins. Mm -hmm. Look in the eyes. Hey, look in the eyes. Look in the eyes. It is not a circle like ours because oh, no, it's not. nature gave us human beings, uh, cows, dogs, other animals, a round eye muscle, so we have a round iris. Mm -hmm. Goats and sheep have either a rectangle or a oval. It all depends on how the light hits it. Oh, look at the pigs! These are girl pigs. And when they get older, they can give birth to 10 babies each. Now, look at their nose. Some have a big nose, some have a small nose, okay? But these are the kind of pigs that you would have found here if you came in 1772. <laughs> Let's go see the sheep. I'd like everybody look at their coats. This is wool. He's got a wool hat. Wool, 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 and wool. This is all from the sheep. 
The wool keeps them nice and warm. Between the wool and the skin is a oil called lanolin. Keeps them waterproof. Before the summer, we take the wool off, we wash the wool, and we make clothes out of it. These are the chickens of Rhode Island Reds. And because they're Rhode Island Reds, they lay brown shell eggs. Most people don't know how many eggs a chicken lays in a day. One every 26 and a half hours for two to three years. One every 26 and a half hours for two, for two to, to three, three years. years. So and how many eggs does one chicken make in its lifetime? Marty, go. Too many. <laughs> <laughs> I never counted. Then Marty took us to the old farmhouse built in 1772, where we learned what colonial life in New York was really like. It was common back then to have 10 or 12 children, but it certainly was not all fun and games for the kids. In colonial days, as soon as your child was five years old, they were considered a young adult. A young adult because you were fighting for survival. This is how you were dressed right up there. We've got two dolls. Uh, you ladies certainly didn't get up in the morning and say, what am I going to wear today? This is what you wore the same outfit almost every day. You took a bath. Three, every three to four months, child said, no, I don't like this food, and they were over five years old. Not a good thing for a child to say. So you ladies had a right to tell your children, if you don't like my food, well, you don't like my food, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to hear about that. So now you're not gonna eat for two to three days because you don't like my food anymore. Very tough life in those days. Over five years old, the child learned very fast never to say no. What Max has to do, he has to walk out of the house, go north a half a mile to running water. These are oak buckets. He's going to have to fill that up. It's going to weigh a good 40 pounds, and he has to come back. This is all before breakfast time, and he has to make four to five trips. <laughs> and since he's over five years old, he can't say no. That's part of his job. If they can remember something, something, then I've done my job. So. I, I hope you enjoyed what you did today. We did, Marty. Thank you. <laughs> now, no show is complete without a stop for sweets. So before we head back home, let's check out another slice of Americana right here in Queens. When you roll up to Eddie's Sweet Shop on Metropolitan Ave, you may feel like you've just traveled back in time. A true original. This ice cream shop hasn't changed much since it opened its doors almost 100 years ago. And today, it's busier than ever. There are floats to make, sundaes to scoop, and copious quantities of caramel and chocolate to drizzle on top. These are perhaps some of the most decadent sundaes I've ever laid eyes on. Thank you. It's like an art form, right? Vito Citrano's pop came to New York from Italy when he was just 16, and after various odd jobs, ended up making ice cream here. He then bought the shop in the 60s, and now his son runs the place. We have uh, grandparents bringing their grandchildren and telling them that they used to come here when they were their age. This is what everything used to look like back in, in the old days, in the 1920s and 30s. Is this an original? Yes, everything you see here is original. All the fixtures are original. Uh, this counter, the tiles. The stools. The stools. The refrigerator is about 75, 80 years old. It's one of the first electric refrigerators. Now, even if your kid only orders a chocolate cone, like most of ours did, you should know that all of the old school ice cream flavors like Rocky Road and Rum Raisin are all made on the premises, as are all the syrups, the hot fudge, the caramel, and of course, that whipped cream, which will bring you to your knees. Your job might be as good as mine. Uh, probably even better. <laughs> <laughs> what is this again, Tommy? Chocolate soda, chocolate ice cream, and coffee chip ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> whipped cream on top. The verdict? Mm. Awesome. So good. I'm glad. Tommy's been working here for four years, and he has mastered making the most decadent sweet treats we have ever seen. You can get anything from one plain scoop on a cone to something uh, you know, as a banana royal, which would be three scoops with syrup, whipped cream, sprinkles, bananas, walnuts, cherry. So. Okay, I think I'm not going to eat the whole thing, but I think I need to see you make one of those. You want me to make one for you? I think so. All right, I can do that. Okay. All right, three scoops. Craziest thing I've ever seen, Tommy. One, two, three. Um, mm. You want the cherry on the top? Really good. Oh, yeah. How about this? You want this piece right on the top? That's not even a cherry. Piece. Dun 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 If you 
want information on any of the stories in today's show, all you have to do is find us on Facebook at Tony on New York. And while you're there, why don't you tell us what we should do next week? Because maybe we should take on your neighborhood. Mommy, can you press that blue button, please? I sure can. We'll see you next time on Tony on. is taking off, showing off the best New York has to offer. So whether you're looking for family fun, you have a need for speed, or you just want one wild ride, Tony on New York, the hip list of what's happening in and around the tri-state area. Sponsored by ChevyOffers.com.